Welcome to The Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. Today, we return to Joseph Murphy and a powerful teaching on using the subconscious mind in business. Joseph Murphy did a great job of straddling that very gray area between the spiritual and the physical in manifesting prosperity in a spiritual way. He taught the way our subconscious interacts with the world, particularly when it comes to wealth and attracting money. I've always found his teachings to be authentic and powerful, and they always have these nuggets. The language is amazing. Dr. Joseph Murphy, using the subconscious mind in business. Long before our Bible was published, ancient wisdom said, as a man imagines and feels, so does he become. This ancient teaching is lost in the night of time. It is lost in antiquity. The Bible states, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Legend relates that many thousands of years ago, the Chinese wise men gathered together under the leadership of a great sage to discuss the fact that vast legions of brutal invaders were pillaging and plundering the land. The question to be resolved was, how shall we preserve the ancient wisdom from the destruction of the invaders? There were many suggestions. Some thought that the ancient scrolls and symbols should be buried in the Himalayan mountains. Others suggested that the wisdom be deposited in monasteries in Tibet. Still others pointed out that the sacred temples of India were the ideal places for the preservation of the wisdom of their god. The chief sage was silent during the entire discussion. In fact, he went to sleep in the midst of their talk and snored loudly. Much to their dismay, he awakened in a little while and said, Tao, or God, gave me the answer. And it is this. We will order the great pictorial artists of China, men gifted with divine imagination, which is the workshop of God, and tell them what we wish to accomplish. We will initiate them into the mysteries of truth. They will portray or depict in picture form the great truths, which shall be preserved for all time and for countless generations yet unborn. When they are finished with the dramatization of the great truths, powers, qualities, and attributes of God through a series of picture cards, we will tell the world about a new game that has been originated. Men throughout the world for all time will use them as a game of chance, not knowing that through this simple device they are preserving the sacred teaching for all generations. This was the origin of our own deck of cards. The ancient Chinese sage according to the legend, added, if all the sacred writings were destroyed, they would again be restructured at any time through the symbolic teachings and inner meanings of the various designs on the playing cards. Imagination clothes all ideas and gives them form. Through the divine artistry of imagination, these artists clothed all these ideas with pictorial form. In the act of imagination, that which is hidden in your deeper self is made manifest. Through imagination, what exists in latency or is asleep within you is given form in thought. We contemplate that which hitherto had been unrevealed. Let us take some simple examples. When you were going to be married, you had vivid, realistic pictures in your mind. With your power of imagination, you saw the minister rabbi or priest. You heard him pronounce the words. You saw the flowers and the church. And you heard the music. You imagined the ring on your finger and you traveled through your imagination on your honeymoon to Niagara Falls or Europe. All this was performed by your imagination. Likewise, before graduation, you had a beautiful scenic drama taking place in your mind. You had clothed all your ideas about graduation in form. You imagined the professor or the president of the college giving you your diploma. 
You saw all the students dressed in gowns. You heard your mother or father or your girl or boyfriend congratulate you. You felt the embrace and the kiss. It was all real, dramatic, exciting, and wonderful. Images appeared freely in your mind, as if from nowhere. But you know and must admit that there was and is an internal creator with power to mold all these forms that you saw in your mind and endow them with life, motion, and voice. These images said to you, for you only we live. A young man said to me in the army before he was discharged, I see my mother clearly. I can now imagine her welcome. I see the old home. Father is smoking a pipe. My sister is feeding the dogs. I can see every mark and corner of that home. I can even hear their voices. Where do all these vivid pictures come from? Keats said that there is an ancestral wisdom in man, and we can, if we wish, drink of the old wine of heaven. The spirit or God in you is the real basis of imagination. Once in an examination in London, I did not know the answer to an important question. I got still and quiet and sat over and over again slowly, meditating in a relaxed way. God reveals the answer. In the meantime, I went on answering the other questions, which were easy. We know that when you relax the conscious mind, the subjective wisdom rises to the fore. In a short while, the picture of the answer came clearly into my mind. It was there in words like a page of a book, with the entire answer written out as a graph in the mind, a mightier wisdom than that of my conscious mind or intellect spoke through me. I had a very religious schoolboy, about 14 years old, come to me. Whenever he had a problem, he said to me, that he would imagine Jesus was talking to him, giving him the answer to his problem and telling him what to do. His mother was very ill. This boy was highly imaginative. He read the story of Jesus healing the woman with the fever. My little friend related to me. Last night I imagined Jesus saying to me, Go thy way, thy mother is made whole. He made that drama of the mind so real, vivid, and intense that due to his faith and belief, he convinced himself of the truth of what he heard subjectively. His mother was completely healed, yet she was considered at that time hopeless and beyond medical help. Being a student of the laws of mind, you know what happened. He galvanized himself into the feeling of being one with his image, and according to his faith or conviction, was it done unto him. There is only one mind and one healing presence as the boy changed his conviction about his mother and felt her perfect health, the idea of perfect health was resurrected in her mind simultaneously. He did not know anything about spiritual healing or the power of imagination. He operated the law unconsciously and believed in his own mind that Jesus was actually talking to him. Then, according to his belief, was it done unto him. To believe something is to accept it as true. This is why Paracelsus said in the 16th century, whether the object of your belief be true or false, you will get the same results. There is only one spiritual healing principle and one process of healing called faith. According to your faith is it done unto you. There are many processes, methods, and techniques of healing. And all of them get results, not because of the particular technique or method, but because of imagination and faith. In the particular process, they are all tapping the one source of healing, which is God. The infinite healing presence permeates all things and is omnipresent. The voodoo doctor with his incantations gets results. So does the kahuna of Hawaii with his ministrations, the various branches of new thought and Christian science, the Nancy School of Medicine, osteopathy, and so on. All these schools of thought are meeting levels of consciousness and are doing good. Any method or process that alleviates human misery, pain, and distress is good. Many churches practice the laying on of hands. Others make novenas and visit shrines. All are benefited according to their mental acceptance or belief. When you are willing to stand alone with God and cease completely giving power to external things, when you no longer give power 
to the phenomenalistic world, which means to make a world of effect a cause, and when all your allegiance is given to the spiritual power within you, realizing it as the only presence and the only cause, you will not need any props of any kind. The living intelligence that made your body will respond immediately to your faith and understanding, and you will have an instantaneous spiritual healing if you're not at that level of consciousness where you can grow a tooth through prayer the obvious thing to do is to go see a dentist pray for him and for a perfect divine oral adjustment as long as you believe in external causes you will seek external remedies to illustrate further the power of imagination i will tell you about a close relative of mine who had tuberculosis his lungs were badly diseased so his son decided to heal his father he came home to Perth, Western Australia, where his father lived, and said to him that he had met a monk who sold him a piece of true cross and that he gave him the equivalent of $500 for it. This young man had picked up a splinter of wood off the sidewalk, went to a jeweler's, and had it set in a ring so that it looked real. He told his father that many were healed just by touching the ring or the cross. He inflamed and fired his father's imagination to the point that the old gentleman snatched the ring from him placed it over his chest and prayed silently and went to sleep in the morning he was healed all the clinic's tests were negative you know of course that it was not the splinter of wood from the sidewalk that healed him it was his imagination aroused to an intense degree plus the confident expectancy of a perfect healing imagination was joined to faith or subjective feeling and the union of the two brought about the healing the father never learned the trick that had been played upon him. If he had, he probably would have had a relapse. He remained completely cured and passed away 15 years later at the age of 89. I know a businessman here in Los Angeles who has reached the top in his field. He told me that for 30 years, the most important decisions he ever made were based on his imaginary conversations with Paul. I asked him to elaborate, and he remarked that Few people in the business would realize the wonderful guidance and counsel they could receive by dramatizing in their imagination that they were receiving counsel from the writers or great seers of the Bible. I will quote this successful executive as accurately as I can. Many times my decisions might have prospered the company or plunged it into bankruptcy. I vacillated, wavered, and got high blood pressure and heart disease. One day the idea came to me, why not ask Jesus or Paul? I loved the epistles of Paul. So when an important decision was to be made, I would imagine Paul was saying to me, your decision is perfect. It will bless your organization. Bless you, my son. Keep on God's path. After imagining I saw Paul and heard him, a wave of peace and inner tranquility would seize me. I was at peace about all decisions. This was this businessman's way of receiving divine guidance by using his imagination to convince himself that right action was his. There is only one principle of intelligence in this world. All that is really necessary is to say and believe, God is guiding me now, and there is only right action in my life. The mind, as Troer tells you, works like a syllogism. If your premise is correct, the conclusion or result will correspond. The subjective reasons deductively only and its sequence or conclusion is always in harmony with the premise establish the right premise in your mind you will be subjectively compelled to right action inner movement of the mind is action the external movements and action is the automatic response of the body to the internal motion of the mind hearing a friend or associate congratulate you on your wonderful decision will induce the movement of right action in your life. The man who used St. Paul to impregnate his mind with the belief of right action was using the one eternal principle of intelligence. His technique of arriving at that place in his mind does not really matter. Goethe used his imagination wisely when confronted with difficulties and predicaments. His biographers point out that he was accustomed to filling many hours quietly holding imaginary conversations. It is well known that his custom was to imagine one of his friends before him in a chair, answering in the right way. In other words, if he were concerned about any problems, 
he imagined that his friend was giving him the right or appropriate answer, accompanied with the usual gestures and tonal qualities of the voice, making the entire imaginary scene as real, as vivid, as possible. I was very well acquainted with a stockbroker in New York City, who used to attend my classes at Steinway Hall there. His method of solving financial difficulties was very simple. He would have mental, imaginary conversations with a multimillionaire banker friend of his who used to congratulate him on his wise and sound judgment and compliment him on the purchase of the right stocks. He used to dramatize this imaginary conversation until he had psychologically fixed it as a form of belief in his mind. Mr. Nichols Uspensky's student used to say, watch your inner talking and let it agree with your aim. This broker's inner talking or speech certainly agreed with his aim to make sound investments for himself and his clients. He told me that his main purpose in his business life was to make money for others and to see them prosper financially by his wise counsel. It is quite obvious that he was using the laws of mind constructively. Prayer is a habit. This broker regularly and at frequent intervals during the day returned to the mental image in his mind. He made it a deep subjective pattern. That which is embodied subjectively is objectively expressed. It is the sustained mental picture that is developed in the dark house of the mind. Run your mental movie often. Get into the habit of flashing it on the screen of your mind frequently. After a while, it will become a definite habitual pattern. The inner movie that you have seen with your mind's eye shall be made manifest openly. He calleth things that be not as though they were, and the unseen become seen. Many people solve their dilemmas and problems by the play of their imagination, knowing that whatever they imagine and feel as true will come and must come to pass. Some time ago, a certain young woman was involved in a complicated lawsuit that had persisted for five years. There was one postponement after another with no solution in sight. At my suggestion, she began to dramatize as vividly as possible, her lawyer having an animated discussion with her regarding the outcome. She would ask him questions and he would answer her appropriately. Then she condensed the whole thing down to a simple phrase. As suggested years ago by the French School of Mental Therapeutics, she had him repeat it over and over again to her. The phrase she said was, there has been a perfect harmonious solution. The whole case is settled outside court. She kept looking at the mental picture whenever she had a spare moment. While in a restaurant for a cup of coffee, she ran the mental movie with gestures, voice, and sound equipment. She could imagine easily the sound of his voice, smile, and mannerisms. She ran the movie so often that it became a subjective pattern, a regular train track. It was written in her mind, or as the Bible says, it was written in her heart and inscribed in her inward parts. Her conclusion was, it is God in action, meaning all around harmony and peace. Harmony is of God. What you want in a legal case is a harmonious solution. In the science of imagination, you must first of all begin to discipline your imagination and not let it run riot. Science insists upon purity. If you wish a chemically pure product, you must remove all traces of other substances as well as extraneous material. You must, in other words, separate out and cast away all the dross. In the science of imagination, you eliminate all the mental impurities, such as fear, worry, destructive inner talking, self-condemnation, and the mental union with other miscellaneous negatives. You must focus all your attention on your ideal and refuse to be swerved from your purpose or aim in life. As you get mentally absorbed in the reality of your ideal by loving and remaining faithful to it, you will see your desire take form in your world. In the book of Joshua, it says, Choose ye this day whom ye shall serve. Let your choice be, I am going to imagine whatsoever things are lovely and of good report. I know and have talked to many people who diabolically invert the use of their God-given faculty. The mother, for example, imagines that something bad has happened to her son, John, because he is late coming home. She imagines an accident, a hospital, Johnny in the operating room, and so on. A businessman whose affairs are prospering yet dwells on negativity is another example of the destructive use of imagination. He comes home from the office, 
runs a motion picture in his mind of failure, sees the shelves empty, imagines himself going into bankruptcy, an empty bank balance, and the business closed down. Yet all the time he is actually prospering. There is no truth whatsoever in that negative mental picture of his. It is a lie made out of whole cloth. In other words, the thing he fears does not exist save in his morbid imagination. The failure will never come to pass except he keeps up the morbid picture charged with the emotion of fear. If he constantly indulges in this mental picture, he will of course bring failure to pass. He had the choice of failure or success, but he chose failure. They are chronic worriers. They never seem to imagine anything good or lovely. They seem to know that something bad or destructive is always going to happen. They cannot tell you one reason why something good should and could happen. However, they are ready with all the reasons why something dire and evil should occur. Why is this? The reason is simple. These people are habitually negative. That is, most of their thinking is of a negative, chaotic, destructive, morbid nature. As they continue to make a habit of these negative patterns of thought, they condition their subconscious mind negatively. Their imagination is governed by their dominant moods and feelings. This is why they imagine evil, even about their loved ones. For example, if their son happens to be in the army, they imagine that he is going to catch cold, become an alcoholic, or become loose morally. Or if he is in combat, they imagine he will be shot, and all manners of destructive images enter their minds. This is due to the hypnotic spell of habit, and their prayers are rendered null and void. Make a choice now. Begin to think constructively and harmoniously. To think is to speak. Your thought is your word. Let your words be as honeycomb sweet to the ear and pleasant to the bones. Let your words be like apples of gold and pictures of silver. The future is present, grown up. It is your invisible word or thought made visible. Are your words sweet to the ear? What is your inner speech like at this moment? No one can hear you. It is your own silent thought. Perhaps you're saying to yourself, I can't. It is impossible. I'm too old now. What chance have I? Mary can, but I can't. I have no money. I can't afford this or that. I've tried. It's no use. You can see your words are not as a honeycomb. They are not sweet to your ear. They do not lift you up or inspire you. Uspensky was always stressing the importance of inner speech, inner conversation, or inner talking. It is really the way you feel inside, for the inside mirrors the outside. Is your inner speech pleasant to the bones? Does it exalt you, thrill you, and make you happy? Bones are symbolic of support and symmetry. Let your inner talking sustain and strengthen you. But the word is very nigh unto thee, in thy mouth and in thy heart, that thou mayest do it. See, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil. Decree now and say it meaningly. From this moment forward, I will admit to my mind for mental consumption. Only those ideas and thoughts that heal, bless, inspire, and strengthen me. Let your words from now on be as apples of gold and pictures of silver. An apple is a delicious fruit. Gold means power. Pictures of silver in the Bible mean your desires. The picture in your mind is the way you want things to be. It is the picture of your fulfilled desire. It could be a new position or health. Let your words, your inner silent thought and feeling coincide and agree with the pictures of silver or your desire. Desire and feeling joined together in a mental marriage will become the answered prayer. Be sure you follow the imagination of the Bible and let your words be sweet to the ear. What are you giving your ear to now? What are you listening to? What are you giving attention to? Whatever you give attention to will grow, magnify, and multiply in your experience. Faith cometh by hearing. Paul says, listen to the great truths of God. Listen to the voice of God. What language does he speak? It is not Gaelic, French, or Italian, but the universal language or mood of love, peace, joy, harmony, faith, confidence, and goodwill. 
Give your ear to these qualities and potencies of God. Mentally eat these qualities, and as you continue to do so, you will be conditioned to those positive, enduring qualities, and the law of love will govern you. You've heard this oft-repeated quotation, man is made in the image and likeness of God. This means that your mind is God's mind, as there is only one mind. Your spirit is God's spirit, and you create in exactly the same way and through the same laws God creates. Your individual world, that is, experiences, conditions, circumstances, environment, as well as your physical health, financial states, and social life, and so on, is made out of your own mental images and after your own likeness. Like attracts like. Your world is a mirror reflecting back to you your inner world of thought, feeling, beliefs, and inner conversation. If you begin to imagine evil powers working against you, or that there is a jinx following you, or that other forces and people are working against you, there will be a response of your deeper mind to correspond with these negative pictures and fears in your mind. Therefore, you will begin to say everything is against you, or that the stars are opposed to you, or you will blame karma, your past lives, or some demon. Truly, the only sin is ignorance. Pain is not a punishment. It is the consequence of the misuse of your inner power. Come back to the one truth and realize that there is only one spiritual power and it functions through the thoughts and images of your mind. The problems, vexations, and strife are due to the fact that man has actually wandered away after false gods of fear and error. He must return to the center, the God presence within. Affirm now the sovereignty and authority of this spiritual power within you, the principle of all life. Claim divine guidance, strength, nourishment, and peace, and this power will respond accordingly. I will now proceed to point out how you may definitely and positively convey an idea or mental image to your subconscious mind. The conscious mind of man is personal and selective. It chooses, selects, weighs, analyzes, dissects, and investigates. It is capable of inductive and deductive reasoning. The subjective or subconscious mind is subject to the conscious mind. It might be called a servant of the conscious mind. The subconscious obeys the order of the conscious mind. Your conscious thought has power. The power you are acquainted with is thought. In the back of your thought is mind, spirit, or God. Focused, directed thoughts reach the subjective levels. They must be of a certain degree of intensity. Intensity is acquired by concentration. To concentrate is to come back to the center and contemplate the infinite power within you that lies stretched in smiling repose. To concentrate properly, you still the wheels of your mind and enter into a quiet, relaxed mental state. When you concentrate, you gather your thoughts together and you focus all your attention on your ideal aim or objective. You're now at a focal point where you are giving all your attention and devotion to your mental image. The procedure of focused attention is somewhat similar to that of a magnifying glass and the focus it makes of the rays of the sun. You can see the difference in the effect of scattered vibrations of the sun's heat and the vibrations that emanate from a central point. You can direct the rays of the magnifying glass so that it will burn up a particular object upon which it is directed. Focused, steadied attention of your mental images gains a similar intensity and a deep, lasting impression is made on the sensitive plate of the subconscious mind. You may have to repeat this drama of the mind many times before an impression is made, but the secret of impregnating the deeper mind is continuous or sustained imagination. When fear or worry comes to you during the day, you can always immediately gaze upon that lovely picture in your mind, realizing and knowing that you have operated a definite psychological law that is now working for you in the dark house of your mind. As you do so, you are truly watering the seed and fertilizing it, thereby accelerating its growth. The conscious mind of man is the motor. The subconscious is the engine. You must start the motor, and the engine will do the work. The conscious mind is the dynamo that awakens the power of the subconscious. 
the first step in conveying your clarified desire idea or image to the deeper mind is to relax immobilize the attention and get still and quiet this quiet relaxed peaceful attitude of mind prevents extraneous matter and false ideas from interfering with your mental absorption of your ideal furthermore in the quiet passive receptive attitude of mind effort is reduced to a minimum in the second step you begin to imagine the reality of that which you desire for example you may wish to sell a home in private consultation with real estate brokers i have told them of the way i sold my home they have applied it with remarkable results i placed a sign in the garden in front of my home that read for sale by owner the second day after placing the sign i said to myself as i was going to sleep supposing you sold the house what would you do i answered my own question and i said i would take that sign down and throw it in the garage in my imagination i took hold of the sign and pulled it up from the ground placed it on my shoulders and went to the garage and threw it on the floor saying jokingly to the sign i don't need you anymore i felt the inner satisfaction of it all realizing that it was finished the next day a man gave me a deposit of a thousand dollars and said take your sign down we will go into escrow now immediately i pulled the sign up and took it into the garage the outer action conformed to the inner there is nothing new about this as within so without meaning according to the image impressed on the subconscious mind so it is on the subjective screen of your life this procedure or technique is older than our bible the outside mirrors the inside external actions follows internal action i was engaged by a very large organization to do some spiritual work for them through fraudulent means others were trying to lay claim to their vast mining and other interests they were harassing the company by legal trickery and trying to get something for nothing i told the lawyer to dramatize vividly in his imagination several times daily the president of the company that he represents congratulating him on the perfect harmonious solution as he sustained the mental picture through continuous mental application the subjective wisdom gave him some new ideas as he said right out of the blue he followed these up and the case was closed soon afterward if a person has a mortgage due at the bank and he does not have the money to cover it and if he will faithfully apply this principle the subconscious mind will provide him with the money never mind how when where or through what source the subjective mind has ways you know not of its ways are past finding out it is one of the instruments or tools that god gave man so he could provide himself with all things necessary for his welfare the man who hasn't the money to meet the mortgage can imagine himself depositing a check or currency required in the bank that is giving it to the cashier the important point is to become intensely interested in the mental picture or imaginary act making it real and natural the more earnestly he engages his mind on the imaginary drama the more effectually will the imaginary act be deposited in the bank of the subconscious mind you can take a trip to the teller's window in your imagination and make it so real and true that it will actually take the place physically there's a young lady who comes to our sunday morning lectures regularly she had to change buses three times it took her one and a half hours each sunday to get there in the sermon i told how a young man prayed for a car and received one she went home and experimented as follows here is her letter in part published with her permission dear dr murphy this is how i received a cadillac i wanted one to come to the lectures on sunday and tuesdays in my imagination i went through the identical process i would go through if i were actually driving a car i went to the showroom and the salesman took me for a ride in one i also drove it several blocks i claimed the cadillac as my own over and over again i kept the mental picture of getting into the car driving it feeling the upholstery etc consistently for over two weeks last sunday i drove to your meeting in a cadillac my uncle in inglewood passed away left me his cadillac and his entire estate if you are thinking well i do not know of any way to get the money to pay off the mortgage don't worry about it to worry means to strangle 
realize that there is a power inherent within you that can provide you with everything you need when you call upon it. You can decree now, with feeling and conviction, my house is free from all debt, and wealth flows to me in avalanches of abundance. Do not question the manner in which the answer to your prayers will come. You will do the obvious things necessary, knowing that the subconscious intelligence is directing all your steps, for it knows everything necessary for the fulfillment of your dreams. You can also imagine a letter from the mortgage company informing you that you are paid up, rejoice in the image, and live with that imaginary letter in your mind until it becomes a conviction. Become convinced now that there is a power within you that is capable of bringing what you imagine and feel as true into manifestation. Sitting idly by, daydreaming and imagining the things you would like to pass will not attract them to you. You must know and believe that you are operating a law of mind, become convinced of your God-given power to use your mind constructively to bring into manifestation the thing you desire. Know what you want. The subconscious mind will carry out the idea because you have a definite, clear-cut concept of what you wish to possess. Imagine clearly the fulfillment of your desire. Then you are giving the subconscious something definite to act upon. The subconscious mind is the film upon which the picture is impressed. The subconscious develops the picture and sends it back to you in a material, objectified form. The camera is you consciously imagining the realization of your desire through focused attention as you do so in a relaxed, happy mood. The picture is cast on the sensitive film of the subconscious mind. You need a time exposure. It may be two or three minutes or longer depending on your temperament, feeling, and understanding. The important thing to remember is that it is not so much the time as the quality of your consciousness, degree of feeling, or faith. Generally speaking, the more focused and absorbed your attention is, and the longer the time, the more perfect will be the answer to your prayer. Believe that you have received and ye shall receive. Whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. To believe is to accept something as true, or to live in the state of being it. As you sustain this mood, you shall experience the joy of the answered prayer. That concludes Using the Subconscious Mind in Business by Dr. Joseph Murphy. As a fan, I found this one very enjoyable in the examples and techniques that are given in how you have imagined in the past, giving some very obvious examples of times that most people have imagined and their imagination has been successful. When you got married, when you graduated from school, you naturally imagine in those circumstances walking on stage, grabbing the diploma, holding the diploma in your hand. I love those examples and the way he describes focusing the attention like a magnifying glass. The way that you focus the attention is very much the way that this works. It's not going to happen just by simply daydreaming. It is focused attention combined with desire that brings about what you want. And he gives examples of a variety of different religions. And underlying that is this idea that whatever you believe is what will come to pass. So the man that believes he's wearing a ring that is from the original cross, it works. And then he has no more tuberculosis in his lung. Oftentimes, people are healed and people will imagine things because they believe something to be true, even if it's not true. It's the imagination at work. But the second level of imagination is that faith component, that part of you that knows for sure that this thing is going to happen, just like you knew for sure you were going to get married, just like you knew for sure you were going to graduate. You got the grade, you're going to get your diploma. You knew for sure that it was going to happen. Now, one thing I would love to discuss, an example that's often used in Neville Goddard lectures and New Thought teachers and in a number of Joseph Murphy lectures is the story of somebody imagining a car or a house that they want and then their cousin dies and then they get the house or car. Isn't that like a bad thing? Like, wouldn't you feel guilty if you genuinely knew that you imagined for that Cadillac and then your uncle died? Did you kill your uncle with your imagination? 
Neville Goddard addressed this in one of his lectures, saying that, don't worry about it. The whole vast world is you pushed out. But still, I would rather nobody die because of what I'm imagining, so I imagine everything is in the best interest of all, with the free will of all, and I try to continue to underlie my imaginative power because if I am truly powerful, then I can imagine without having anybody die so that I receive money from them. But it's a minor thing. In any case, like attracts like. Your world is a mirror reflecting back to you your inner world of thought, feeling, beliefs, and inner conversation. Never forget that. The subjective mind is the powerful part of you that brings about all the things that you want. Never forget it. And you can change what you believe and know. People do it all the time. You see it on TV. People believing things that are obviously not true. The mind is very, very flexible and you can believe the most insane and crazy things. We meet people every day that believe things that are absolutely positively not true and you can do it too. So you have to have this ability to let go of the outside world a little bit and be willing to believe in what it is that you want and know in your heart that it will happen. That's when the power is activated. You can find all episodes of The Reality Revolution at therealityrevolution.com. Check out my art at www.newearth.art. It's my passion and it's all done with love. I'm hoping that everybody out there is having a fantastic day and I'm imagining joy and happiness for you. God's spirit is within you and you are awakening every second. Your imagination is all powerful and all the things that you ever wanted, all that is good and wonderful and joyous are yours. And welcome to the reality revolution. Mm-hmm.